I suppose that you subscribe to this course in order to become a better chess player. My task is therefore to help you to improve your game. To achieve that, we would have to establish in which direction we are moving. There is a saying that no wind can be favorable for a ship that doesn't know where it sails. So, in order to understand what we have to do, let's think about the very nature of the game of chess. So, chess is played move by move, unlike many other games, many other sports. Here you can play one move at a time, and then you have to wait for your opponent to play his move. A former world champion, Vasily Smyslov, said once that when I play a chess game, all I am trying to do is to play 40 good moves. If my opponent manages to find 40 good answers, it will be a draw. If he doesn't, I will win. Simple, isn't it? Maybe it's an oversimplification, but there is definitely a grain of truth in it. If you can find good moves, you are going to be successful. So our task is to learn how to find good moves, one at a time. And in order to do that, we have to learn how to look at a chessboard, what to look for. I believe, I'm almost sure, that while listening to me, you were also looking at this position in front of you and trying to figure out what's going on there. It's easy to see that it's white smooth, because if black were to move, he just would have made it, checkmated in one by playing queen h1. And it's a checkmate in net. It's not easy to get out of it. Initially, it's not seen. It doesn't seem even possible to get out of it. The only way to stop Black from checkmating in one is to make sure he doesn't have time for it. And by the rules of chess, it means giving checks. Yet, if you check those options, check checking options, so to say, you'll see soon enough that after a move like, let's say, knight g6, black will simply take. And now there is absolutely nothing else you can do. So by playing knight g6, or playing knight f7, After rook takes f7, it's exactly the same. There is nothing else you can do. And you effectively delayed your resignation by just one move. So the only other option to keep fighting, to try to achieve a positive result, would be to stop black from checkmating physically, and that's to play rook h4. Now black would be happy to still do the same, queen h1, checkmate. But for the fact that it's not, because there is a rook that can take the queen. So, on the other hand, it seems pretty safe for black to simply take the rook. And now we have the same position, the same threat. I mean, not exactly the same position, but the same threat to checkmate in one. 
now the king can try to flee to squeeze out of the mating threat of the check mating threat but by now white is already a whole room down and obviously he will have no chance to compete so if white is not able to create any threats he will lose and creating threats still means to give checks so the former checks that we tried still will bring about the same result uh, and that is no result but there is one more check that is now available which seems completely suicidal Queen G8. We offer a whole queen. We actually impose the queen on blacks, either king or rook. But so suddenly there is a glimmer of hope. We can see that if black takes the queen with the rook, we suddenly checkmate in one. And that's a beautiful smothered mate. Who wouldn't dream about ending a game like that? On the other hand, there is seemingly no need, at least not yet, to take with the rook. A more natural move is king takes g8. And now we have less and less pieces. And we're almost running out of checks. Almost. Because there is still exactly one check. 97. However, this check leaves black. Only one square to escape to. That very square the king came from. King h8. And now we still can check the king by playing knight f7 it's not a smothered mate so the rook doesn't take the g8 square away from the king yet the king cannot go there because of our knight on e7 and the rook must take the knight and suddenly with our one of the only two remaining pieces we can make a last effort and check once more only to find out that this time there is no escape not for white but for black he can delay a checkmate by one move but then it happens look at his position again and now look at the starting position. In the starting position, nothing seems to hint at what, at what is about to happen. Because white is two pawns down to start with, and his king is in a mortal danger. And yet he prevails. Is it a difficult combination? Is it an easy combination? Well, in fact, it's quite easy because white is given no choice. He must attack the queen to stop the checkmate. He must check, 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 keep checking because otherwise he will be checkmated himself. Or just run out of material. So how come that white manages to win in such a seemingly hopeless position? That he manages to snatch the proverbial victory from the jaws of defeat? How can we even imagine 
that something like that might be possible. If you look at this position, you see many problems for white. At the same time, there is one potential problem for black. Once again, look at the final position. Black's king is alone. There are four more pieces. Black has four more pieces. And none of them participates in defending the king. Two of them are on the offensive. They are threatening to checkmate white king, or they were threatening, to be precise. The other two, though, are doing nothing and less than nothing. Once again, to be precise, this knight is doing less than nothing. Because if this knight were not there at all, just imagine the knight disappeared, then the rook on a8 would suddenly be able to control the back rank. And no combination would be possible to start with. So that's an indication of black's future problems. This rook, this one piece on a8, that is not participating in the game, that is not doing anything at all, and the knight next to it, that is doing less than nothing, because it stops the rook, so its influence is purely negative. If you look at it, and then you realize that the back rank, black's back rank, is being protected by just one piece, and the same piece is somehow involved in stopping the check on f7. So this one rook on f8 is now controlling two key squares, f7 and c8. And it has no help, or almost no help, whatsoever. That's the main weakness. This back rank that is severely underprotected is black's main weakness. And this weakness is the reason, the main reason, that the combination is possible. If we are experienced enough to realize that two pieces out of five are not participating in anything at all, are not contributing, and at the same time, white's five pieces are doing something. They don't seem very effective in the beginning, but as the game unfolds, we see that each of them plays a part. Formally speaking, in the starting position, white is two pawns down. But in some way, as a matter of fact, you might say that he is a rook and a knight up. And that's, as I said, the reason for the combination. Yet, the reason alone, or several reasons, is not enough you need to actually pull this combination off. You need to perform. You need to play particular moves. And those need and those moves need to achieve particular goals. So they are means to an end, to our desired end. Let's see what exactly those moves do. So our first move, rook h4, 
what does it do apart from stopping Blatt from checkmating? Which doesn't count as a reason for the combination, because it's a purely defensive part or task of this move. How do we figure out what this or any other move does for a combination? It's pretty simple. We just check the next move, and if necessary, the next one, and one after that, and so on and so forth. In this case, the second move of the combination is Queen G8. Could White possibly play Queen G8 without playing Rook H4? As you can see, the answer is no. That would be against the rules, because the diagonal is blocked. So by playing rook h4, white unblocks this diagonal and enables his own queen to go all the way down to g8. So the first means that we might record, that we might remember, is unblocking something. It might be a rank, a file, a diagonal, a square. We unblock by moving our own piece that is in the way of another piece of ours. Now the second move. What does that achieve? Let's see. In that variation where the rook takes, we checkmate in one move. Could we do it on the previous move? Obviously no, because first of all, knight f7 here, I wouldn't even be a checkmate. The king would be able to come to g8, or the rook would be able to take the knight. By playing queen g8, we made sure that if the rook takes, it stops controlling the f7 square, and it prevents the king from coming to g8. We don't want this rook to control the f7 square. We want this square for ourselves, to check the king. And we want to make sure that when, once we've checked the king, it has nowhere to go. So we don't need the rook on f8, and we need it very much on g8. By playing queen g8, if, in case, it's taken by the rook, we achieve a double goal. We make sure the rook doesn't control f7 anymore. Or we might say, let's use this term for the future, it's a pretty convenient one, that we distract the rook from protecting or controlling the f7 square. At the same time, we want the rook on g8, so we attract it to g8. We distract a piece from some task. We attract a piece to where it serves our purposes. And of course, we're talking about the opponent unlike unblocking, in attracting and distracting, we deal with the opponent's pieces. And those are useful terms and useful notions, because as you check the other variation, when black takes with the king, and check the next move, you immediately realize what the king I mean, what our move achieved. The next move, 97, wouldn't be possible 
Well, I'm wrong. It would be possible. But if the king were not on g8, knight e7 wouldn't be a check. Not being a check, it wouldn't stop black from checkmating us in one move. So we needed this king on g8 badly. Unless we got a chance to checkmate it on h8 in the previous direction. So, our queen attracted the king to g8. Once again, remember, we distract from, but we attract to. And now knight e7. On the one hand, it's just a check. It, it buys us time. So sounds like it's nothing special. It doesn't achieve any special means. I, I suggest that we call move like that, moves like that, any moves like that, power moves. We just demonstrate our strengths, our muscles. We can check you and prevent you from doing what you want to do, and that is checkmating us. At the same time, when you analyze the next two moves, so our next move clearly distracts the rook from protecting the 8th rank. The rook must take, and it doesn't protect the 8th rank anymore. Now we can check, and eventually checkmate. Yet, if we go a little bit back, we will see that this power move knight e7 actually enabled the rook to come to c8. The knight on c6 was blocking the rook's path. So once again we had to unblock the c file, in this case the c file. And if we go all the way back, we might even say that our very fast move, rook h4, was also unblocking or partially unblocking the c file for this rook from c1 that seemed initially the last or the least involved piece, yet it came all the way to deliver the final blow. So apart from unblocking the diagonal for the queen, rook h4 also unblocked the file for the rook. It's quite a lot. Two in one, a double task, a double achievement, and yet it's not all. Because, look at the starting position. Now we don't even think about the last or the penultimate move of the combination rook c8 yet well having the knowledge that we have already about the final position we we might give a closer look to c8 and find out that that the queen on h3 actually goes all the way to c8 and keeps an eye on it. It doesn't go there physically, but it stops anything else from coming there safely. So our wonder move, our magic move, our unimaginable move, rook h4, is actually a triple score, not only a double, a triple score because it also distracts, by force, distracts the queen from the diagonal h3, c8. And because the queen has to go, and then the rook has to leave the 8th rank, suddenly the c8 square becomes unprotected. 